Next up, we're going to have Andy and Kitty Quitmeyer, um, who are going to show us open source toys for endangered animals. Hi. You're muted. You're Hello. No Can you hear us OK? Cool. Um, I'm going to share a screen. Da, 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 da. We got this going on. Can you see a sun bear licking some tubes and stuff? I'm going to assume yes. Um, I haven't seen any chats that say we can't hear yes. you. Okay, perfect. Yes. Um, so, hey, this is, uh, I'm Andy. I'm Kitty. Yeah, there's uh, more visual references if you don't know uh, who we are. Because uh, there's lots of animals you might get us confused with. That's Lupe the Agouti. And this is Valencia the Tapir. Um, so we have a special guest star, Kitty's here, uh, joining us today, who will be able to answer some questions uh, at the end because uh, she's my partner uh, and we both work at Dynalab and we've both been working with these really cool animals and it's cool she gets to uh, be here for this talk. We're both a little bit sleepy because we just came from, we're on a layover in Atlanta from a big scouting trip to Sri Lanka. Um, and so we're kind of out of it, but jet yeah, jet lagged, I, but it'll be good. Um, so the main thing that we want to talk with you all about today um, is making toys for fun, endangered animals. This is Valencia. She's uh, eating this pineapple that's on a string. Um, <laughs> can you all see, does the video play? I'm curious if the, the video plays or if you're just seeing a static image. Sometimes it does that. Okay, perfect. So I'll make sure to, because we got lots of fun, silly videos of our nice, goofy friends playing around with toys that we made. Um, and so the talk today will be about making toys, um, making open source toys that we can share with other people who work with animals uh, that are engineered for helping out these nice creatures. Um, this talk isn't going to be as much about uh, like showing you like, oh, here's what we did and here's how cool it is. It's kind of more of a, of a call to arms, um, a request for other people working in open source hardware and software uh, that this is a fun thing that you can do if you're interested. Um, so a little more background on what we do. Uh, this is where we're usually based. This is Gamboa, Panama, right in the middle of Panama, right in the middle of the Panama Canal, um, and next to some really cool, um, amazing forest around there. And we have a little lab that we call Digital Naturalism Laboratories, um, or Dynalab for short. And we focus on making art and technology uh, for interacting with nature and trying to do as much of this in the wild as we can, in kind of non-human controlled spaces uh, where the animals that we try to work with or plants or other living creatures uh, tend to live and exist. Um, our, our, sp our space is pretty basic. We have a house that we've converted into like a construction shop with 3D printers, laser cutters, prototyping workshops, electronics labs, a little art science gallery. And we focus on trying to, because we're, we're kind of remote, uh, we're in the jungle and it's hard to get materials there. So that helps extra put an emphasis on trying to upcycle all the prototyping materials that we use. Uh, we try to actually use them from the community's garbage um, and we shred them and or 3D print them with pellet style printers. Um, and so you've, you've seen several other people doing cool uh, different plastic works already at this event. Um, and so the two main things that we tend to do at our lab is one, help field biologists and two, help animal rescues. So first, what does it mean we're, we're trying to help out field biologists? Uh, well, we do like design and consulting work. This was old computer vision work, working with ants, checking out who the ants are gossiping with at the watering hole. Um, other examples, this is an open source 360 degree camera trap. So most camera traps, you have one field of view, but what if you want to know about the agoutis who are behind the camera trap? Um, so you could have you could hack 360 degree cameras uh, for checking out things like that. Um, we also do field site maintenance. Um, there's lots of field biologists who come to lots of these really scientifically important field sites around where we live in Gamboa, Panama. But unfortunately, many of their field sites have fallen into non-maintenance from organizations that used to take care of them, but don't as much. Um, and so we go out there and try to help the field biologist uh, keep some of these spaces accessible. Um, we also try to sponsor Spanish classes um, and other community events 
uh, to try to bring the, a lot of visiting scientific researchers from all over the world uh, in closer contact uh, with people in the community around us. Um, we offer long and short-term residencies. We've, we've done field courses out here. Uh, some other things that we tend to focus on is making like mobile maker spaces. This is a project where we made a, a floating uh, maker space in the Philippines called the Boat Lab. Um, we've also done things called hiking hacks where it's kind of like a, a mobile hackathon uh, where we join up with a field biologist in their uh, field sites and actually try to carry all of our tools and convert the workspace into a place where we can interact with nature and do things in different ways. And perhaps one of the biggest things that we do is, uh, is Dynacon, the Digital Naturalism Conference. Uh, and this is a big event uh, where we have over 100 people from all around the world who the goal is to have them living and working together um, in a semi-remote location uh, for an extended amount of time, usually like four to six weeks. Um, with the entire goal of figuring out new ways of interacting with nature. These can be high-tech ways, these can be low-tech ways, these can be fun uh, jungle robots that climb up trees. But one of the key components of it is that everything that everyone does is documented and shared and reviewed by our own community and then published freely and openly. So all the projects are all shared um, completely freely on our websites and stuff. And we've had a Dynacon in Thailand, a Dynacon in Panama, and I've been lucky enough that two of the other chairs of Dynacon this year are Lee and Sid, who are also running this event uh, right now. So that's super cool. Um, and so we're actually going to have one in Batikalao, Sri Lanka in July. So that's actually what we just came back from doing. And so that's a little bit back about all the other stuff that we do at Dynalab and where we want to try to interact with things in nature. But we also do a little bit of interacting with things that aren't as much in nature for different reasons. So we tend to work with uh, this group called the APPC, uh, which is a really wonderful, nice um, uh, conservation organization. Uh, they rehab injured animals. Uh, the goal is to release all the animals after we rehabilitate them right back into the wild. Um, the organization's over 10 years old. It's in Gamboa. They've rehabbed thousands of sloths. Um, and we've released uh, generally about 95% of the animals. Um, they, they're kind of pretty awesome. They're kind of squatting in a lot of abandoned buildings at this hotel just leaves in kind of disrepair. Um, and so there's a tapir in just the backyard of a house that's been kind of fenced off. Uh, there's a uh, all kinds of different animals there. Uh, this is, again, the tapir. Uh, here's some of our design clients. There's Valencia the tapir, Lucio the spider monkey, Inez the ocelot, um, and many more. There's a, uh, um, which one's that? I think that's Pino, the, uh, the tree porcupine. <laughs> and so uh, we work with a lot of these animals, but why, why open hardware for animal rescues? Um, well, there's a big need for it. Um, animal rescues have really limited resources. I mean, most of this this whole animal rescue we're working with is just going by on like uh, 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 donations. donations, yeah, just strings and threads, just trying to get by. Um, and usually, the animal rescues are just trying to, uh, you know, they're they're prioritizing helping these animals. The animals will be horribly injured or terrible things will happen to them. And so usually it's more about like, we need to get this thing living and then be able to work with it. But unfortunately, some animals are so injured, they're never, even if they're kind of stabilized, they're never able to fully leave the animal rescue. And so that means that uh, they have to stay there for a really long time. And unfortunately, enrichment, trying to keep them occupied while they're also stuck there, potentially for the rest of their lives, um, is usually a last priority because everyone's so busy at the animal rescue. Um, the other thing, too, is everyone at animal rescues is generally non-experts. Um, when we first started working at this animal rescue, we didn't know anything about tapirs. We were not tapir experts who started working with the tapir. Um, we've had to, like, figure a lot of this stuff out by ourselves. And this is pretty much the same with most people who are working at animal rescues. Plus, there might be some people who are experts at something, but because you're not in charge of, you know, like maybe I'm really good at sloths, but now we have a, you know, 400 pound tapir we have to take care of. It's a little bit different. 
The other reason the open hardware community should care about this is because it's fun. Um, you all, in general, if you're here, you like to build things and play with things and test them out. Um, and building things for a lot of these endangered animals, it can be kind of like you have a lot of freedom to play and experiment. You're not going to get judged uh, if, it, if it looks kind of funky. You might get judged a little bit. Um, <laughs> when I made a one tapir toy, it looked very ugly, but the tapir loves it. <laughs> um, there's lots of applications for high and low tech kind of things. I mean, you saw there was a pineapple hanging on a string. There's no Arduinos involved with that at all, uh, but uh, it's still an effective type of, of hardware that you can make and also share different ideas with other uh, people who want to build them. For instance, what type of string to wear? What are you building the base out of? What types of pineapples are you feeding to what types of animals? All this information can be documented and shared with other people. Um, it's also a good way to escape, you know, kind of anthropomorphism. Uh, you can take a break from thinking about how do things work for people and what do people want to do and embrace the really weird challenge of like, well, what's interesting for a tapir um, versus, you know, me or versus a monkey or versus a, uh, an ocelot. And so um, the final thing is it's a really badass challenge because there are a million ways everything can go wrong. You have to weatherproof things. You have to tapir proof things. Um, you have to make it, uh, it's, it's very, very tricky. Um, so let's get into more specifics about designing uh, for captivity and enrichment. Um, so here's an example of some otters playing a keyboard. Um, let's take a step back and just talk about captivity in general. There's many reasons that us humans are keeping non-human living creatures uh, trapped somewhere, um, potentially against their will. One reason is we want to eat them. We're like, there's that chicken. I'm going to put it in a cage until it's big and then I eat it. Other things are can be for entertainment. Oh, we caught this whale or porpoise and we want to make it do backflips and then all clap and we make a bunch of money off of it. Um, but there's, there's other reasons too. Um, for instance, scientists, a lot of scientists, this is our, our one of our residents at Dynalab right now, Jorge, uh, who studies uh, birds in Panama, and he's caught an arasari that they uh, put tags on and monitor their movements in order to help track them for conservation and other scientific data. And then the, the final reason that you might uh, have animals in captivity is because uh, they are they might get hurt or they're already hurt um, or you're helping protect them. Uh, for instance, we have Lucio the spider monkey. Um, he was uh, somebody's pet, right? Uh, let me find this left. Yeah, people are putting too much. Perfect. Um, and so like Lucio, for instance, uh, was somebody's pet and chained to like a fence for like, like a tree. Yeah. A tree for like five or 10 years. Um, it was super sad. And then, but now we've rescued him. Um, Lucio is, is healthy. And a lot of people ask us, why not just release Lucio back in the wild? Well, the problem is, is that Lucio is, is a spider monkey um, and they work in large social groups. And if they don't have these social groups and we just toss them into the forest, um, chances are other primates will probably kill him. And so it's very sad, but Lucio has to kind of remain with us uh, indefinitely. And so part of our job can be to try to make their welfare better. And so there's a group called the Shape of Enrichment that talks about different ways of doing enrichment, primarily focused at zoos, um, but all these are applicable to any animal that's in captivity. Um, and they list some guidelines for how to, how to, what are the rights of an animal in captivity? There's freedom from hunger and thirst, discomfort, pain, fear, and the freedom to express normal patterns of behavior. Um, and so the, so that can kind of help us think about normal patterns of behavior are things that they can't really get because they can't just roam around wherever they would normally be in the normal environment. But we can try to recreate some of these things through toys and, and enrichment things that help improve their mental health, which then also helps improve their physical health. And so we can do, uh, I can talk about some quick design guidelines we've come up with for enrichment in general. Um, we'll start with uh, the keepers and the animals because we need to think about both of these. So for instance, the keeper design guidelines, you need to think about safety. Um, you might have these wonderful sloths and everyone's like, oh my God, you hang out with these sloths and oh my gosh, 
Can they get any cuter? Look at those three-toed sloths that Kitty's uh, feeding. This one's just drinking some milk. It's a sweet little baby. That one's eating a flower. What? Oh, my gosh. So nice. But sometimes they bite you. And so uh, Kitty actually got a really terrible bite. Uh, these two-toed sloths have huge teeth. Fangs. Fangs. Big, sharp fangs. Blood everywhere. Um, she has a scar right now. She's got pretty bad ass. I, I always will have that scar. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and that was because there was a sloth, that there was other external factors outside when we were handling them normally. It's This sloth was suddenly stressed out and actually bit her. And so we need to think about the safety of the keepers whenever we're making any of these toys that, you know, they're not going to be endangered by trying to use it or giving it to them. Uh, all the toys need to be maintainable. Um, you need to think about like, so for instance, this is the ocelot's cage. It's basically a giant cat and a giant cat has a giant litter box. Um, and so we, how do we, you know, have something that, you know, recreates ways that they would normally go to the bathroom, but we can clean up easily. The answer to that is kind of, yeah, giant litter box, lots of sand that we rake and you have kind of a, a Zen garden kind of deal. Um, and so safety for the keeper and maintenance, you know, being able to clean your things, are, are two of the key guidelines for the keeper side. But then for the animal side, uh, you can think about, we need three things. We need the toys to be interesting. They need to be tough. They need to be durable. And they need to be also safe for the animals. In terms of interesting, it's it's tricky. What, what makes something interesting for a wild animal that's very unlike us? Um, in biology, they have something called the four Fs, which are fighting, fleeing, feeding, and mating. <laughs> um, and then uh, in enrichment for like zoos and stuff, they talk about maybe the five Fs, which are like feeding, fighting, and fleeing. You can call that play. Friends, which is like social interaction, figuring things out, uh, or also the final F, mating again. And so examples of this are is feeding is one of the most common ones you'll see in zoos and animal rescues. You give the, the animals something they like and they munch it. And, um, you know, this is a, a trigger fish uh, hitting something. Um, then there's also fighting and fleeing. This is kind of like things that try to like spark their interest in other ways. This is like a, a cat playing with uh, some cool toy. Um, then there's also the friends aspect, which mainly you need to think about whether things are social. Some things are very social, like orangutans, and you want to design them to collaborate or do things together. Other animals are very unsocial, like red pandas that mostly want to be by themselves. Um, you can even have companion animals as enrichment. So, for instance, Valencia the tapir used to be very grumpy when she was first at the animal rescue and would smash out of her pen all the time and go roaming around Gamboa. But then they found her a best friend named Lupe, who's an agouti, and they fell in love. And now they both kind of like walk around and they live together and they have a nice time together. So it's not even necessarily a technology uh, per se, but, you know, knowing about what kind of things you might be able to pair up with um, can be surprising. And then, of course, there's mating. You can learn about that if you go to Wikipedia's Panda Pornography um, web page. But uh, I'll go through this kind of quickly. But when you're designing these things, you can think about what are the senses that they're using? Um, what types of habitats uh, are they using? Are you trying to recreate the habitat? Or are you trying to give a really novel stimuli? That's like nothing they've seen before, but the animal still wants to engage with and interact with. Um, and then you can also think about different types of puzzles. Um, this was one that we actually built with the Singapore Zoo and some of my awesome students when I was a professor. Um, this was a, a puzzle for sun bears. It would use little motors to squirt honey in different tubes and capacitive touch sensors to sense the tongue of the sun bear uh, so that it would always change where the, the honey was squirting. So it would always have to keep looking around. You also need to think about toughness. Um, because you can build a really nice little tippy seesaw thing for your tape ear that's bolted into the ground with big sticks of rebar, and you'll come and someday <laughs> she'll just totally knock it over for no reason after it's been working for four months. Um, she'll also decide she wants to chew through uh, some big part of it for no reason, um, even though she leaves the other parts alone. So you have to learn a lot about these things. Uh, you also need to think about safety. If the animal can break something and accidentally eat it, um, it can be very bad for them. So like we use a lot of things that are super durable, like old tires um, or recycled HDPE. 
Um, what can you do? I'm going to wrap up real quick. Uh, if you make an idea, let us know and we can try to help test it out. You can also volunteer for a local animal rescue and help make fun toys. And you can document and share. We have all of our documentation at richmond.tech. And that's us. Yeah. It's incredible. It's so amazingly cute and valuable. Um, there's a ton of people who just want to know more about all the animals that you shared because you know you don't run into them all the time unlike you um so maybe you can hop into discord as you have been earlier thank you kitty thank you andy